episode two of Woo. the talk show that is yet to really be named, but it's, we'll call it Two Women Talking. Yeah, for now, that's what it will be. That's what it is. So how you doing? I'm good. I would say that things over here are boring in comparison to this van life adventure you're on. So please tell me, what have you been up to? Where are you right now? I never know where you are. My cousin Mike's house and I get to park in the driveway and it's been awesome because I feel like this part of my family understands me more than my nuclear family. <laughs> so we really connect. And we went kayaking on Saturday. So I loved it. I had only had experience in the Florida sun going kayaking before that. And I had gone with Ben, my old roommate. I'd always gone with some dude, some weird dude, dusty dude, I would call it. And then the, I also went in the cold in South Africa in 2019, but I was like really depressed at that time because it was right after my divorce and the dust had settled from a lot of things. So it was the only experience I had kayaking. So but I really wanted to go. I was like, yeah, let's do it. And it was just this idyllic little lake called Thai Hack in the Bighorn Mountains. And I was in heaven. I was like, you can, you don't have to be on a river. You don't have to keep up with your, the dusty dudes you're with. You can just paddle. You can just be there. Mm -hmm. And it was the most positive experience that I had ever had kayaking. And I kind of fell in love with it. I was like, this is amazing. This is amazing. So I, we got back and I bought a kayak that night. So I bought an, wow. an inflatable kayak. It's called Boat, B-O-T-E. And it has inflatable like chambers or whatever. But the bottom part is really solid. So you can stand up paddleboard on it too, which was really cool. I was a little worried because I wear hearing aids and I didn't want to fall in because the paddle boards are less stable than kayaks. But this kind of solves, it's like bumpers on your paddleboard if you stand up on it in the kayak and you can take the seat oh, wow. and lay down on it. And it's just it's really versatile. And that's what I was looking for, something that was high quality that I would feel good about using. So it gets here Friday and the original plan, I mean, I really have no plan. Let's say I don't have a plan. When I van life, I think I started out that way where I would plan five, seven, two weeks in advance. And I would freak out if I didn't have a place to stay two days from now or one day from now, but now I wake up in the morning, I don't know where I'm gonna stay that night. I may not even know where I wanna go that night, but oftentimes I will lay in bed at night and think about it. I'm like, okay, well, what's around here? What do I, where do I wanna go next? Let's look at the places to camp because I've been challenging myself to boondock a lot, which boondocking is basically free camping. So I've parked next to a little pond by a fairgrounds where I had originally gone to just get water but I ended up parking by a pond that had a nature trail next to a golf course. So I got a little hot girl walk in in the evening and then I just got to sleep next to a pond. It was really peaceful and all these, and I love to add those spots to the IO Overlander app that tells you where all the spots are. Cause I feel mm. like that's my contribution to the community of overlanders. It's the app is called IO Overlander. So that's how I found so many camping spots. And I, but every time I find something like I found water in a cemetery one time, I'm like, gotta add that. Cause there's so much water in that cemetery. It was wild. It was just spigot after spigot every 20 feet in this massive cemetery. Wow. And I was like, if somebody just needs to pull up alongside it, like I did to fill up their water because I think this was in Michigan. Yeah, Michigan. And I had tried to camp at some campgrounds, but everything was sold out. And that's what I like about, I don't really like planning ahead necessarily because it's now I have to be at this spot and there's this constant pressure to be like at a certain place at a certain time. And you, there's no spontaneity. And I've really learned to love the spontaneity and being in the flow because the anxiety that I had about planning ahead that me living in the future and it's hard to be happy when you're always thinking about where you have to go next instead of being where you are and that's true in life yeah. too. it's true in work it's true in business stop trying to be someplace else you know which is like the most ridiculous thing when I think about the leaving my religion losing my religion I was writing about that did you see what I shared the response that somebody had to that they'd been on my list for probably a decade and probably not that long because I've only been in business for a decade but they had written to me and yeah. they were like I'm part of the true faith did you see that I did yeah mm -hmm. he was I, I put it on my Instagram the screenshots and I blacked out his last name but I was like I don't want what you're offering Timothy but he responded and he was like I'm not part of Christianity I'm not part of any of these denominations or any but I am part of the Lord's Recovery Church of the true faith the one true faith and that's like mm -hmm. the true faith the one true faith mm -hmm. and that's right there when somebody tells mm -hmm. you that they're part 
nothing part. It was, don't take offense, but I don't want to hear any more of your nonsense. He literally said that. <laughs> and I was like, no offense, but this is extremely offensive. <laughs> yeah. Let me know if you're open to hearing about, it will revolutionize and enlighten you what I have to offer. It's the, I don't know, real Jesus. I forgot exactly what he said. It was like the most ridiculous thing ever. And then I also posted my response, which was like, your Jesus would be shaking his head. It's such a turnoff that you would tell me that something that was real and authentic because he was like, oh yeah, what I have to offer is real and authentic, but yours, what you have, what you just wrote is nonsense. And that's just not, you don't disrespect somebody like that and then offer them Jesus. It's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. And I told him, please don't contact me again. But what does he do? Responds two more times. So I just block him. He responded two more times and he was just like, oh, well, I care about you. So if you do want to talk about it, I'm still available. And so desperate, like such desperate energy. I think he's actually a creepy dude. <laughs> I just think he's a creepy uh -huh. dude who wants my attention and screwed up. And I called him out on it. And now he's like trying to backtrack is what it feels like. So yeah. Uh <laughs> there was a guy I, so I blocked on Instagram, but then he joined the Facebook group. His name is Andy Davis. And I swear he's a scammer. I finally just blocked him on the Facebook group too, because he was like, in in response to my $1,500 one month container, which is, I think, a really good deal because you get access to me privately for 30 days on Voxer after an hour and a half long session. He was just like, I just don't see what the value is. I wouldn't pay more than $100 for a consult with you. And then the possible outcome is that you just smile for an hour and a half and I'm out over $1,500. And I was like, well, I don't, it has to go both ways. <laughs> like the client has to be, the client has to be somebody I want to work with too. So if somebody doesn't think I'm worth more than $100 an hour, or thinks that the only thing that I can do is smile during a session, that's not somebody I want to work with. Plus, I think he's a scammer, so I just kicked him out of the group. And Yeah, well, okay, so here's the thing with that. It, there's two parts to this. First of all, you could buy anything and it can turn out to be a piece of shit. Like, you can't, that's part of the risk of paying for something, right? Like, you can buy new shampoo and all your hair could fucking fall out. That's the risk, right? Okay, that's that. But also, besides him probably being a scammer, the coaching industry, like we've spoken about, there are a lot of people who are charging exorbitant amounts of money for absolutely nothing. And that that could be a reason why somebody would just be so jaded and in, you know, whatever energy zone that he's possibly in, which I want to talk about energy zones today, but whatever sort of, is that, he's in fighter. Do we think that he's possibly in the fighter energy zone yeah. <laughs> trying to be fighter. super combative? Fighter. Cause he was, that was the other thing. I was like, I don't want to work with anybody who calls me babe. Cause he would always say, think about it, babe. But to me, so he's kind of trying to come off of this white guy, right? His name is Andy Davis. But the way he talks, it sounds like a contrived person who doesn't speak English as a first language. So he's trying to make it seem like he's just like this good looking American guy. And you go to his Facebook profile and there's nothing. So I think he's fake. I think he's fake. And he was always coming off as fake because he's like always commenting on posts like, I want to meet with you, always complimentary. And I guess people think that works where a good looking guy is paying you attention and then you just, you know, start talking to them. And I've been, I mean, you know, I've been scammed before, right? I told you about that. Mm -hmm. I have really good looking guy yeah. into mm -hmm. retrospectives. That's maybe that's why I went through that. I was like, oh man, there's so many other scammers that are becoming your way in the future. So you need to be prepared. And it's, it was worth the lesson because people have lost a lot more than I did <laughs> that kind of scam. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, he's probably the type of person who also has like fake celebrity Instagrams where he like messages people and he's Leonardo DiCaprio. Thank you for watching my films. He's probably one of those people. Yeah. <laughs> like one time I had a fake James Vanderbeek, right? Is that his name? The one from Dawson's Creek? Yeah. That he followed me and messaged me and I was like, look at me. I've made it. Yeah. And he wasn't real. People have oh, God. stolen my profile too. And I, I guess they've stopped doing it. Like it hasn't, hasn't happened in a while, but for a long time, it was like a new, it had to have been the same person, just new profile after new profile, doing the same thing, trying to get people to message them on Telegram. And I think trying to charge people 50 bucks for financial advice or something. And somebody fell for it. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this. Like, yeah. Did that. I've had people do it to me too. So actually the first time I found out about it was when you and I went to go see Cirque du Soleil. 
when we were sitting in the theater waiting for it to start, somebody messaged me and they were like, there's somebody pretending to be you on TikTok. So I think that if you have a video that's going viral or if you offer any sort of session that happens, like for you, they're saying financial advice because you were posting about, you know, being a millionaire. So they just automatically think, oh, if I say financial advice, people are going to want that. But with mine, because I was offering human design readings, then they were reaching out to people pretending to be like these oracles who can tell your future and and whatever and trying to approach people for sessions. But I think that what happens is it's one account and they keep changing the person that they're impersonating. So it's hard to kind of, it's hard to, first of all, on TikTok, it's not as easy to get people banned and, or anything like that, the same way that it is on Instagram. You know, if somebody's impersonating you, it's a little bit easier to get that settled. But yeah, they just keep changing their name because I would see that people would do that to me and they'd have 11,000 followers. And meanwhile, my account, my TikTok account hasn't really been active in a long time. You know, I don't, I haven't been like blowing up. So I think what's happening is they just keep changing it to be different people. So yeah, these scammers are wild out here. And that's why I do appreciate that you're able to pay for Meta Verified on Instagram now because it's easier for people to know if your account is legit or not. Yeah. And I'm trying to get verified on TikTok too. I haven't applied lately, but the last time I did it, they said that the news outlets that I was on weren't prestigious enough. They literally said they weren't prestigious enough, but you're right. Yeah. When I was trying to report the scammers that were impersonating me, they would always come back and say that there's no violation. Yeah. I was like, what do you mean? They literally have my handle, my photo, my links, my videos, everything, but for all they know, I could be impersonating them, you know? Yeah. I was follow, I follow this guy. He's so funny. He does some of this content where he's reacting to really insane videos online. And he'll go so far as to green screening himself into it looking like he's the person watching that person or he's like part of the party or whatever. He's so talented. He's hilarious. And I was following him. He had 500,000 followers. And then one day I see a comment that's like, you're impersonating. So, and this person who was just somebody else who has 5 million followers, they were able to just keep doing it, stealing this guy's videos, 500,000 followers later, probably making money off of the creator funds, you know? It's so insane. But yeah, it seems like you have gotten rid of some creepy scammers. And I mean, since the beginning of this episode, we have been talking about so far creepy, weird dudes. Yeah, that's the theme. That's the theme. I think there's, it's somewhat disheartening when you work hard to make stuff and we both work hard to make stuff for the channel and the comments are just from creepy dudes. And I find it interesting. I've been replying to some people. There was actually one woman who was like, they love to say that, Oh, 4,000 square feet is not a mini mansion. I was like, well, it's a house that's custom built every inch of it's custom built and it's worth 2.2 million right now. I don't know what you'd call that, but it's people just want to nitpick and they just want to, and that's mm-hmm. a, that's an indicator of low energy. It's a mm-hmm. of who they are. And there's a quote that says, I've thought about this a lot over the last week or so, because we've had some really deep discussions here. We don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. And that's why people in the victim and the fighter energy zones, they're dealing with a lot of introspect, not, not introspective, it's the exact opposite, but they've turned against themselves. And I know because I've lived there for a while. I spent like two or three years in victim mode, two and a half years probably in victim mode, just feeling apathetic. And a lot of that had to do with what was going on in my brain and it not being healthy. But a lot of people just live there. They could be perfectly healthy. I find it actually hard to believe, though, that people can actually be perfectly healthy and also depressed because depression is very physical as well as mental. So the physical is what's very much influencing the mental. So if they're eating really badly, I was eating very poorly if they're dehydrated. Those are all physical things that can contribute to depression. Same thing with having heavy metals in the brain, but a lot of it just has to do with the fact that your brain doesn't have what it needs and your brain doesn't have pain receptors. So the only way it can tell you that something is wrong is by how you feel. So if you're not Mm -hmm. feeling really well, the answer is not, well, I'm a terrible person, which is what I did. I was like, well, I'm just, I don't feel myself. I don't feel like doing anything. I don't like other people. I don't like the way my voice sounds. All these things that were just piling on top of each other. And then, of course, it didn't help that a lot of doctors were telling me that I had bipolar disorder or ADHD or OCD or all these things, but just telling me that I had to take pills for it and there was nothing else I could do. 
that wasn't helping either because I was like, well, I'm broken. I'm not going to have the life I wanted. They literally said, you're not going to have the life you wanted. You just have to get used to that. That's what therapy's for, you know, where you can kind of adjust your expectations for your life. And if I had listened to that, if I had listened to the doctors tell me that my life wasn't going to be what I wanted it to be, I no wonder people get depressed when they go to psychiatrist. They get more depressed when they go to a psychiatrist or some doctor. Because even my general practitioner prescribed me drugs. She just wanted to help me. You know, I don't think she was, she definitely wasn't like out to get me or whatever. But I knew that the taking Seroquel, an antipsychotic that my grandmother took when she was in the mental, or not the mental hospital, the the age care, the memory care center, when she had Alzheimer's, she was taking Seroquel and they tried to prescribe me that. And I was like, that's not what I want. And that's not going to solve the issue. So it goes kind of hand in hand. And in many ways, we are victims to the society that we live in and the fact that our food is poisoned and the information that we receive is inaccurate. And we think that there's some outside cause that we can't control or like our genes is causing us to be are, are causing us to be sick and that we don't have control over that. And it's just a whole bunch of lies. It's a whole bunch of lies. Yeah, I. it's so interesting. Do you have a healthier lifestyle? then you notice the times where you are not following your usual routine, that's when it becomes more obvious to you. So you know that part of my creativity, one of the things that I love to do is make charcuterie boards. Like I really am so good at them. If I go to a party or if my mother's having people over or whatever, I love to make a charcuterie board. So we had some family in town on Sunday. My mom's brother and and his wife, my aunt and uncle, they were here and my mother has been making focaccia from scratch and it's been so good. And I was like, okay, I'll make a charcuterie board. We haven't had one of those in a while. And I still didn't eat as much of it as I normally would. And I slept terribly that night. All of the sodium, I think from it, I just, and it was just more food than I've been eating because I've been in a calorie deficit. We've been calorie deficit girlies the last few weeks. I, it was just, I overindulged and I slept terribly. And then I was depressed the next day. I genuinely just didn't feel great. And it like, it set me off for, I want to say two days that in the middle of the afternoon yesterday, I just had to lay down and I was crying. You know, my husband's wrong. Is it the salt? He said, oh. yeah, it's oh, it's the salt. <laughs> it was literally just like a sodium hangover. And I felt so depressed. Like I, I genuinely just did not feel well and it was it, like I was mentally drained from eating foods that don't do the right thing for me. But I, I would love to hear because, right, like you you bring the nutritional wellness awareness to people, right? But you're not a nutritionist. You're not a registered dietitian. You're happy to share that wealth of knowledge, but it's not that's not your thing necessarily. I do think that there is this thing that happens when you work on your energy, switching your energy, then you're able to take on that identity of those habits, right? And then like that, then that in itself, it's like coming hands in hand. Can you explain like why the energy part is so important and it's not just eat healthier, drink more water, like why that energy and identity piece of it is so key? Oh yeah, it's a huge part. So you can have a perfect diet and still be depressed, I think, because there is a major element. I wouldn't say that it's all mindset or all nutrition that has to go hand in hand because we're whole beings. First, I want to describe what energy is. Energy is basically everything we are. It's our essence, but the building major building blocks of our energy come from our beliefs, our thoughts, and our feelings because that's what's creating our actions and that's energy as well. Money is energy, but money is like a byproduct of our energy. So it's all this integrated thing. And our thoughts and our feelings are creating our actions that are creating what we do and don't do. But the most important thoughts that there are, or part of our energy, are the most important element of our energy, I should say, is our beliefs and our thoughts about ourselves and who we are. So the belief you have about who you are. So for example, if I think I'm a loser, or if I think I'm a has-been, or if I think I'm an unattractive middle-aged woman, like this asshole on my Instagram recently, it was like, oh, well, you're just giving hope to mid- unattractive middle-aged women everywhere. I was like, wow, it's sad that you see the world that way. 
But if wow. I think that about myself, if I think that about myself and I believe other people's perceptions of me, which many of us do, our concept of who we are comes from these reflections that we have gathered from other people. So maybe we were in fourth grade and we got rejected by our friends or somebody in middle school told you that nobody likes you and you don't know any better at that time. So you internalize that and it becomes part of who you are. If your sister always said that you're a terrible dancer or was always telling you to shut up, you might internalize that what you have to say isn't important. So you kind of create this concept of yourself, your self image around these perceptions and reflections that you get from other people because you don't know how to look within yourself to figure out who you really are and allow that to shine because we're just blank canvases when we come into this world. But I do think we do come into the world with a purpose as well. So that energy is the most important energy because it's from, it's like the well from which everything else springs. So if I think that I am above average, and this is not like in a narcissistic way, like I'm better than everybody else kind of way. But if you recognize your talents and you recognize what you're good at and what you love, and you just kind of let that light shine without dampening it, because a lot of people are very conditioned to dampen their own light and try to keep other people comfortable by not being too big or too fast or too loud or just too much, right? Especially as women, that's a big thing. And that's because they have, they've internalized this belief about themselves that they're too big or too small or too loud or too much in general, or they're not enough, right? They have these kind of subconscious things playing in the background when really that's guiding how they do things, what they do and how they do it. So if you flip that and you're like, oh, well, none of that stuff's true. Who am I really? And you start digging into, we're all love. We're all love at our core. So if you come from a place of love, which sounds so hokey and corny, but if you come from a place of love, an intention of love, an intention of discovering wisdom, having new experiences, that sort of thing, it's all about your intention. It's all about your intention. And that's the intention is energy too. So your intention to seek wisdom, seek new experiences. And we talk about beliefs a lot in the transform retreat. So it's not so much about identifying your false beliefs and like, where are my beliefs? What are my beliefs? It's about going out and having experiences that create beliefs that, for example, I had maybe a subconscious belief. There was definitely some little chatter in the background when my cousin invited me to go. And I was like, My higher self was like, yes, we want to do this, you know, and there was no reason to say no to it other than my past experience, which the ego has this record of, oh, yeah, when you went kayaking last time, but now I'm awake enough and I've healed enough to know that those past experiences with kayaking were with some dusty dudes and in a freezing (laughs) climate where I was like uncomfortable stuffed into a life jacket, you know, and so I was like, you know what, I'm going to try this. I'm not going to tell myself stories about the past that will come because if i had said no i'm not really a kayaking person because of that experience those those experiences i would have missed out on falling in love with something that really lights me up and i love being near the water so getting into a kayak and just paddling leisurely the way i like to hike is just walk leisurely through the woods i'm not really a moderate or extreme thrill seeker when it comes to hiking same with, thing with kayaking it, it is what you make it so you who you are is who you make yourself We get to choose who we are. We're the main character in our lives. We get to choose what it smells like. We get to choose what it looks like. We get to choose what it sounds like. What's your soundtrack of your life? What are you listening to on a daily basis? Are you listening to drama on TikTok? Which who's not guilty of that from time to time, right? I had to turn off TikTok (laughs) because I kept hearing videos about Blake Lively and that whole drama. Yeah, same. (laughs) I just don't care. I like watching your movie. She's pretty, whatever. Like I just who other people are is irrelevant to me It's because that's their business. It's not my business. It is kind of interesting though, you know, because the celebrity world, you present a false identity oftentimes and people think they know you from your movies, but then they get to know the real person and they're like, oh, you're none of your characters. You're just a totally different character. And so that's kind of interesting with the identity. Yeah. But yeah, if you're living in victim mode and it is like this physical component too, because when you're living in victim mode or you're living in fighter mode, zone mode level it's all kind of interchangeable when you're a victim when you're a fighter when you're angry all the time when you're feeling depressed and anxious all the time you your body is creating hormones catabolic hormones like 
cortisol, adrenaline that are like battery acid through your body that drain your body. And it literally makes you blind to other opportunities. I had somebody on my TikTok the other day who was like, well, it's easy for you to stay because you have a van and you have this and I don't have any of that. And I have no love. I have none of this. And I'm like, yeah, but you have a phone and you have a brain and you have yourself. People don't realize how valuable that is. You're not broke. Stop saying you're broke. <laughs> Stop saying you're broke because if you say you're broke, you're going to think like a broke person. You're going to do things a broke person does. And you are creating that. You are creating that. So if you're saying that I'm all these negative things because that's what your fear is, that's what your belief is based on how you've chosen to interpret your past experiences, how, what you have made them mean, because nothing means anything until we give it meaning. So we might have something traumatic happen to us. It could be something terrible. Somebody betrays you. You go through like a nasty divorce or you get shoved into a mental hospital, you know, like I did. And I did make that mean something that it didn't. And it could have been like, oh, well, you know, these people didn't know any better. <laughs> and, and there was a part of me who knew that. There was a part of me who knew that they were operating from fear and that they just didn't know what they didn't know. But the fighter in me was like, they need to know that they messed up and you're never going to get apologies from people either because they don't see it that way if they're not awake and they're not doing the work and looking within themselves to figure out where they went wrong you know you're be waiting a long time for people to be like yeah we're so sorry we didn't know what you're going through and we didn't see things from your perspective nobody's ever going to really be able to see things 100 from your perspective except you so you have to be okay with living there and being your own best friend and when it comes to mental health physical health your life you have to be your own best friend i like to ask clients who's the most important person in your life and it's kind of a true question because when somebody's stuck in the caregiver energy for example where they're in the catabolic zone or the cat or the catabolic zone of the caregiver energy that take that five times fast they will take care of other people but they won't take care of themselves and they'll feel resentful that they're not getting back what they're putting in and they'll be exhausted and they're just giving, giving, but not to themselves. So they're not recharging themselves. And I like to ask them that question because most of the times they'll be like, well, my kids or my husband. And I'm like, no, it's you have to be the most important person in your life. You have to be your own best friend and nobody can be a better expert on you than you. So even though we've been trained conditioned from birth to give our power away to doctors, therapists who know better I find it easier to learn from people who've recovered from the things that I've dealt with, which many doctors haven't gone through the things that I've gone through. Many doctors haven't healed from the things that I've healed from. And I think those voices are important. And so, yeah, even though I'm not a nutritionist or I, I refuse to go back to academia and <laughs> to learn things, you know, <laughs> you don't need to learn things. You don't need to go to school to learn things anymore. That's such an archaic system. Mm -hmm. There's still sometimes people are like, well, how do you know? And I'm like, because I lived it and I've recovered from it. That's how I know. And it's also logic too. It's just logic. And I feel like there's a lot of logic that's been from medicine these days in the name of profits, where mm -hmm. they'll get us to ignore the fact that what you put in your body affects how you feel, <laughs> which is so obvious. It's so logical. To say, yeah. oh, well, there's something that you can't see and there's something that we can't even show you. We can't prove that you have it, but there's a chemical imbalance in your brain. And it's just like, well, what's causing that? Probably the food you eat, probably the other chemicals that you're ingesting causing the chemical imbalance. Duh. It's just logic. But we're so far removed from that logic that people are drinking, thinking it's healthy. People are smoking pot, thinking it's healthy, not knowing what those chemicals are doing to offset the balance and the healing abilities that our bodies naturally have. And we've been trained to think doctors are smarter than us, that science is smarter than our bodies when our since science doesn't know everything about our bodies yet. It just knows a tiny sliver of what our bodies are able to do. They only know 0.0001% about the brain, yet they're trying to treat the brain like experts. And this is, you have this disease forever. You have this disorder forever and you might be able to manage the symptoms, but it's irreversible. And so if you don't really know what's causing it, you don't know all the facts about it. How can you say there's no cure? Because there is, there is a cure to everything just because you don't know what it is yet. doesn't mean it's not real. So you're just outside of your bubble yeah. of awareness, the things, you know, you know, and then there's the things that, you know, you don't know. And then there's everything else outside of that. The answers exist there. The answers exist in one of those bubbles. And just because you don't know where it is doesn't mean it's not real. So, yeah. Can you know, I think that there's probably a bunch of people who are listening who haven't 
heard of the energy zones and they haven't been to transform, which is where, you know, you really teach this. Can you give like a micro lesson on the two different types of energy and then the zones? Like you don't have to go through each one, but I'm thinking that it might be helpful. And then I don't know if it'll be live once this is published, hopefully, but we will have a quiz where you're able to find out what energy zone you've been living in. But I would love for you to give like a micro lesson on the energy zones. Yeah. So at the very bottom, and I like to describe it as kind of like a flashlight, I have a little flashlight graphic. So at the very bottom, you picture a flashlight and then a, a beam of light shooting out. And as you get higher into the higher zones, you have more light available, more energy available. But when you're down in the lower zones of victim and fighter, you can kind of think of it as trying to have this conversation with you, Christina, with two of your fingers shoved into your ribs, or if you have to pee so bad, you can't stand it. It's constantly distracting. It's taking energy away from the things that you really want to be focusing on. And that's gross. Like You just don't want that for yourself. But people live in that zone. People will live as a victim. They'll live as a fighter while they have to fight for everything. Work is supposed to be hard. Work is just has to be a slog. It should be exhausting. You should be tired all the time. It's just the way life is. You got to fight to survive. You got to fight for what you want. All those things that people believe are reality, they spend most of their time there. And then they think that they have a disorder when they're up at a higher zone. They think, oh, well, if I'm happy, if I'm not feeling crappy, then I must have something wrong with me because this isn't normal for me. They get so used to, it's a delusion. It's a delusion to believe that you're a victim all the time. It's a delusion to believe that you, that life should be hard and that you have to work hard to make money. You really, it doesn't mean that you never work hard, right? But you shouldn't be exhausting. You shouldn't be exhausted. You shouldn't be feeling depleted constantly. Burnout is not required to be successful. And my view of success has changed a lot over the years. It's not about how much money you have. It's what options you have available. So are you able to live your best life? Are you able to feel really good every day? Are you able to make choices in what you do with your time? That's freedom. And I think that's real success. So, but if people have convinced themselves in the victim and fighter zones that they don't have that possibility, that's not for people like them, then they're not even going to think outside of that. They're not going to realize that the stress is self-induced because they've decided, well, so-and-so is mad at me. Like a lot of codependency exists down these levels too. This, And it could be in caregiver level as well, but people will drop down into victim and fighter from caregiver oftentimes because they're overgiving and they're not recharging and they're doing it kind of for the wrong reasons. They're not doing it from a place of love. They're doing it to gain acceptance and validation. If they don't get it, they're mad. So the codependency comes from that a lot where if somebody gets mad at them, then their reaction is to hide, to be like, oh, I'm such a loser. You know, I'm so, I can't believe I messed up. Well, what if the person that got mad at you? I'll give an example. I have a family member who consistently gets angry because that's what she chooses. And I used to believe for a long time that because this person was angry that I had done something wrong and that I was in the wrong but no, it was just her making a mountain out of a molehill and making, and it was a lot of, there was a lot of gaslighting going on. And when I realized that I set myself free from a lot of the belief that I had done something wrong, that I was at fault. And, and I saw learning about the energy zones is helpful too, because when you're in that situation, when somebody gets angry at you or they're, they believe that you've wasted their time or whatever they accuse you of doing, then you can see, because you know what your intention is and you can see that they are actually choosing to be a victim. They're choosing to, because they they see you as they are. They're like, oh, well, they're probably doing this and this, and they'll try to gaslight you and be like, well, yeah, you can tell me you had good intentions, but I know the real truth, you know, and it's helpful to understand the energy zones when you are in those types of conflicts because you can choose to not be a part of them. And I think there's a lot of patterns. Somebody's either a victim or they're a perpetrator. So there's just a lot of fighting going on in those lower zones where it's, and of course we see a lot of movies too, where it shows us what you're supposed, what's, what's the normal response when somebody cheats on you, you're supposed to freak the fuck out and start like being angry. Well, I feel like if somebody ever cheated on me, sure it would hurt, but I'd be like, well, this person obviously doesn't want to be with me. And I don't want to be with somebody who would do something like that and to betray me like that. And I'm going to choose to leave because I want to take care of myself. And that's just not where I want to be. But I, I don't think I would get a, like upset about it to where it would like completely take over my life because, okay, well, this person's obviously not getting what they want from me and that's fine. I don't want to be with somebody who doesn't want to be with me. 
it's like more of a conscious perspective mm -hmm. because you see other ways of responding and there's a million ways to respond to everything that happens to us but people get stuck down in the fighter and the victim energy zones because they don't realize that they have a choice to see things else in another way so the next zone above the fighter and the victim zone is the rationalizer, which is kind of part catabolic, part anabolic. And anabolic is more energizing, it's more helpful, it's more constructive instead of destructive. And the rationalizer will say things like, oh, it is what it is, or that's just the way the cookie crumbles and you just gotta deal with it and you know, smile, grin and bear it, <laughs> that sort of thing where they kind of have more acceptance, they have, where it kind of seems they're more sarcastic. They are, see, seems like they're looking for the silver lining and seems like they're looking for the bright side, but there's really that underlying current of anger and victimhood that they haven't really addressed yet. So sarcasm, people who are like, sarcasm is my second language, live in rationalizer zone where they're trying like this fake positivity. And I don't know that necessarily mm. toxic positivity would fit in there, but they're kind of like in denial about how they really feel and why they really feel the way they feel. So they'll say, well, that's just the way it is, or life sucks and then you die. That's, I grew up hearing a lot of those phrases. And people will kind of think, well, that's just reality. You know, it's just life is the way it is and there's not much that you can do about it. So, but you are moving out of those lower energy zones. And then you get into zone four, which is the caregiver zone where you, it's the zone of self-care. So that's where you can take care of yourself. But often what happens is <laughs> women especially will get into the caregiver zone and they're just like, energy is spewing everywhere because they're trying to take care of other people. And then they can drop back down into that victim and fighter zone where they're not getting replenished. They're not taking care of themselves. And that's where codependency can live too, because codependents will base their own happiness on how other people feel about them. And I now recognize when my family member who liked to live in victim mode or fighter mode would lash out at me, I would I was feeling that codependency of I have to feel bad now because that person's mad at me. I upset that person. So I did something wrong, even if I didn't. And there's nothing I can do about their mood. It feels like they want to be a victim. They've chosen to be that instead of being like, oh, whatever, Kate, or just or like consciously telling me how they feel. You know, that person could have been like, you know, I really don't like it when you do that. And I would super appreciate it if you didn't because it makes me feel this way. And could we maybe talk about it in a different way or could you approach this differently? And it's just, that's just the way they are though. They, that's just, just where they're at in their own energy. And you just, when you learn that, you just kind of come to accept it because you can recognize it. So yeah. And transform the whole first day is all about energy awareness. And we're going through the levels now on the bird's eye view, but you go a lot deeper and transform to kind of really recognize it in yourself and recognize it in other people. And a lot of people will live between zone one and zone four, but zone five is when things start really getting good. And those are, that's called the collaborator zone where you start seeing everything as an opportunity. So it's no longer that fake silver lining. You genuinely see the silver lining and everything. Like when I got scammed out of over $300,000 one time, I saw the silver lining immediately. I was like, well, it could have been a whole lot worse. It could have been a whole lot worse. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is a little bit of rationalizer energy, but I was like, I see this as the opportunity that it is to, never it was like continuing education to me it was like you can't put a price on the wisdom that comes from an experience like that and i had a friend comment about i don't know how you're not freaking out right now and i was dating somebody who was literally mad at me for not being upset he was like i don't understand why you're so chill or calm about this well first of all is the acceptance of there's nothing you can do about it when it's over and if I mean, you could try and there was a couple of things that I did try, but ultimately none of it just panned out. So the option that was the most attractive to me was just acceptance because I was about to sell my company. So of course I wasn't in the situation of I lost my entire life savings. It was a small chunk of it. And then it was, you know, the coffers were being refilled as I was selling my business. So it wasn't as big of a hit as it could have been. And I was extremely grateful for that. And it didn't do any good. What good would it do to beat myself up about that? And I think that's where yeah. the awareness piece comes in when I talk to clients who are stuck in the victim and fighter zone where they will say, you know, I beat myself up about this all the time. And I, I asked them, I'm like, how is that serving you? Because what's actually happening is they're using so much energy beating themselves up and making themselves feel bad when they could be using that same exact energy to go someplace else in their minds to look for opportunities to transform that pain into passion, into purpose, 
into something that helps other people. And that's why I tell a lot of the stories that I do now, because I think people need to hear that there's another way to view things. Like I've certainly been betrayed. I've been stabbed in the back <laughs> and all of these things that, you know, I could be a victim of, but I choose to speak about them and I choose to look for what I gained through those experiences. And it feels so much better because in that energy, that's when you become a magnet for the happy things in your life. That you become a magnet for the experiences that help you grow. And yeah, I think you can, you can't be happy if you're stuck in the past. You can't be happy mm -hmm. if you're freaking out about the future. And that's what depression is, is when you're stuck in the past. Anxiety. And of course that powerlessness feeling that comes with it. If I just, I made myself this way. That's where I was. I'm like, I am to blame for who I become. Yeah. But you're not stuck that way. Right. That's where you have to realize like you can take this energy of feeling terrible about yourself and transmute that into an opportunity to learn about yourself to grow, to expand, to find new experiences. And new experiences are what is going to change our beliefs in the first place. And then if you're stuck in the future, worrying about stuff that's never going to happen, most likely, right? People are like, oh, I'm going to run out of money. Well, why do you think that if you've never run out of money before, if you've never been on the street before, why are you mm -hmm. not living under a bridge one day? And that's probably never going to happen. And that's a big piece of advice I give to people who have scarcity issues. It's something that I've used myself is, are you, have you ever, and or will you ever have to live under a bridge? Is it really ever going to be that bad? Or are you just worried that you're going to run out of money? Because somehow people don't realize that money doesn't have any power without them. Like money is nothing yeah. without us behind it, doing stuff with it. So, and that we're the ones who can create that. We're the ones who can magnetize it to ourselves. We're the ones with the value that generates the money. So somebody with a scarcity mindset, there's got to be something under there that doesn't feel its identity stuff, that they don't feel capable, they don't feel skilled, they don't feel smart enough, it's not good enough, not worthy enough, not deserving enough. There's something under there that's telling them that money has to be given to them. They, they can't go out and find it. They can't call it to them in some way. So there's a lot of shifts that go through that. So the, yeah, collaborator is looking for this is a little bit more than a very short version, but the collaborator looks for the opportunities and everything because there's an opportunity in every situ situation. And then you move into visionary where you start seeing the bigger picture of everything and you start seeing the illusion of everything that nothing has meaning until you give it meaning. You start seeing fun and everything too. Like, oh, this is fun. This is a fun challenge. Like I, when I get mean comments, I'm like, oh, I'm going to troll this person a little bit and just ask them a question. I'm curious what made you want to leave this mean comment today. Of course they don't answer, but they probably read the comment and maybe it makes them think, you know? So I see that as an opportunity and a chance to have fun and seeing the bigger picture in that. One thought, one question from a coach, whether you hire them or not, if you're just a troll leaving a mean comment, one question could spark something in them, you know? So I think that's why I do it. And it is fun too. But I used to get all bent out of shape. <laughs> so I'm like, mm -hmm. part of me that believed them, it's just, oh, maybe I am a an unattractive middle-aged woman who gives hope to people on social media. It's like a pseudo backhanded thing, but it would make me think, oh, maybe that's true. Maybe that's true. But, you know, understanding where that person is coming from is a reflection of themselves and that's who they're choosing to be in that moment. I don't want to live there with them. That's everything that changes the whole thing. And then the top zone is the creator zone where you realize that you're the creator of reality. And that's a powerful place to be because it means you're fully present and you see the unity among everyone. And you can see, you, you, you might not be conscious that you're in zone seven, but nothing bothers you. There's no right and wrong. There's no us versus them. There's no, there's no separation. Everything is just kind of together. And so when you see somebody who's down in zone one, just having a hissy fit because of what you did to them or what words, how you offended them by being positive or whatever, you understand, you have compassion. There's a massive amounts of compassion in the higher zones. And that's something I recall distinctly not feeling. I thought because I felt I hated myself so much and you can't feel compassion for others if you don't feel it for yourself. You can only love somebody at the capacity that you love yourself. You can only have empathy at the capacity that you have empathy for yourself. It's like literally this whole idea that we get from the Bible and other holy sacred texts or whatever that when you judge somebody else, you're actually judging yourself and that if you love your neighbor as you love yourself, then 
that's when you know that you're in that higher consciousness, when you genuinely see other people as you, you know, if I was in your shoes, yeah. my mom's shoes, my sister's shoes, my dad's, whatever shoes, we would be exactly the same. And in that way we are the same. And that's why we can't judge other people. So yeah, that's kind of the bird's eye view of the energy zones and we can choose to be in the zone. So it's about awareness. That's the, probably the most important part of that process is just becoming aware that you have options because it can change everything yeah. when you realize like, oh my gosh, I don't have to be mad at this. I don't have to be angry about this. I don't have to start catastrophizing. Like when the city sends me letters about not advertising on Airbnb or peer space or whatever, which they did. They sent me a letter. <laughs> they sent me a letter about um, my peer space after almost two years of having my house on peer space. They finally found my ad. Mm -hmm. They sent me a courtesy notice to let me know that illegal open house parties is what they're saying that advertising on this platform isn't indicative of and it would actually be a violation of the use and occupancy for less than a month ordinance but now i have an attorney and the house is in the name of the trust so they're not addressing anything to me and that's done this weird thing where i feel even less emotional attachment to it so i feel confident letting them know and putting it in my ad that i don't allow anybody members of my private membership association to book and that we don't allow illegal open house parties mm -hmm. and just playing the game. It's really about playing game. And in those higher energy zones, you see life more as a game and that makes it fun. And that's energy that it didn't even occur to me when I was feeling angry about the city trying to prevent me from sharing my home with others that I had the option of seeing it as a game, but when I did see it as a game, everything shifted for me and it's been fun. It doesn't mean that when they send me another notice or, you know, put a sign in my yard that there's not like the old version of me isn't there and it's just like, oh, it feels angry, but now I'm aware of it and I'm like, nope, I don't want to respond in that. I don't want to write a mean email. I don't want to write something impulsively. I want to settle the energy, take my energy back from that situation because they kind of operate on scaring you and trying to make you think that they're going to take your house if you don't do whatever and they can't do that because it's the name of the trust now so i win yeah i know i win it's only a matter of time and the attorney's working on a cease and desist letter yeah and then being willing to stand up and assert yourself i think is something new for me too i, I think because we kind of get trained of oh if this so-called authority figure who's like a 25 year old working at the code of compliance office tells you that you've done something wrong you don't have to agree <laughs> you don't have to agree and i've given them evidence yeah. that they're wrong and so it's just a matter of time now that my attorney is going to be sending me the draft letter hopefully today and we'll send that out and just wait and see what happens but they're not representing me they're representing the trust and they're representing the private members of association that has leased the house and has every right to do what they want in the house because they're they've leased it. <laughs> Not even I want it owned by me. It's all owned by me still. Yeah. Well, so when it comes to you're talking about playing the game and stuff, I even though I'm your friend and I know how you operate and you know the kind of inner workings of your mindset, there was still this thing in my mind that I conflated energy with manifestation. I think that a lot of people think that it's the same thing. And you brought up toxic positivity. So like when you think about energy and being in these energy zones and working your way through to the end of the flashlight, right? How would you say that there's a difference between this and manifestation or that toxic positivity? Like how can you still be acknowledging that there's that there has been trauma or that something bad really does kind of happen to you mm -hmm. and not just pretending that you're this enlightened person when really you might be living in the rationalizer zone? Like I would love for you to kind of touch on that before before we we end today. Yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you mean by manifestors who are just like, oh, yeah, you just manifest stuff. And you just, it just seems so airy fairy. You know what I mean? It's not that the opportunities and the money and the people, the relationships, the experiences are coming into your reality because of some magical power called manifestation, which is the way it's marketed. And I feel like that's quite predatory. It's, it is your energy shifting because when you're down in the fighter zone, which is zone two, or you're down in the victim zone and that catabolic, I call it the catabolic dust cloud of hormones is a physical experience where 
people identify with being so angry you can't see straight like that just it feels like a cloud and you just you're blinded by it it's like white hot rage right that's catabolic energy that's stress hormones that are just coursing through your body and it's making it difficult to see the way forward so when you shift your energy out of those lower energy zones it seems like things opportunities ideas people, relationships start to appear out of nowhere. But really all this happened is you've allowed those emotions to pass through you. You've chosen not to live there. You've allowed those stress hormones to settle down, replace them with the feel-good hormones of maybe being out in nature or something. And you've stopped self-medicating with drugs. You've allowed yourself to heal. And the opportunities, people, relationship experiences, everything that appears magically has already has always been there. You just haven't been able to see it. So it's nothing magical. It's very practical. <laughs> it's very logical of when you're no longer in a space where your energy is going towards hating somebody, hating yourself, feeling like a victim, feeling like you have to fight because you're just so angry <laughs> that all that settles, the dust cloud settles. And you're just like, even in rationalizer energy, you can start to see, well, it's just, it'll be okay. You know, it's going to be fine. It's just fine the way it is. It'll all work out, you know. And then you start getting into caregiver where you are caring for others and it feels really good. You're caring for yourself and that feels really good. You're creating more anabolic hormones that are then lifting you higher. And then you find yourself in collaborator where you're starting to see more opportunities and the opportunity is literally everywhere. And so you're never going to be broke. You're not down in victim mode where you're like, oh, I'm broke and I'm feeling crappy about it. You know, if you're up in the collaborator zone, you're finding business partnerships and starting podcasts, building your team, doing things like that. When you're in the collaborator zone, you're seeing, you're taking more so-called risks that you never would have taken when you're down the victim zone because you're already assuming that, oh, well, I can't spend any of this money or I can't spend money until I've made money. Well, no, that's not the way it works. You're seeing less, you're, you're not operating from fear. And really that's what it comes down to in those lower zones is that you're living in a place of fear. But as you progress and as you, I like to say, become enlightened, but that's not in the hokey way when you're just dropping all the stuff that's not you, all the stories, all the beliefs. And that doesn't mean that nothing bad has ever happened, but you don't live there anymore. It's not happening now. So what can you take out of it? Because there's, you have a choice. So say you were a victim of sexual assault or something, which I, I have been a victim of sexual assault. I could just live there and start making TikTok videos or Instagram reels about how I was victimized and what this person did wrong and, and just live there. And I think there's some accounts that talk about narcissism and I've started to write like memoirs and blog posts and things about what has happened to me. But then I'm like, I don't want to be there. I don't live there anymore. I want to focus on what good came out of the situation. So we have that choice to either live there and be in the toxicity of the negativity, or we can choose to rise above it, not ignore it, acknowledge it, but acknowledge it for what good came out of it. Because there's something that comes out of everything happens for us. Not everything is happening to us. And when you're down in that victim and fighter zone, it's, oh, it's, it's, I can't do anything. I'm powerless. And that's where the depression comes in, the apathy that you're powerless and, and that things just are the way they are and you can't fix it and you're not in control at all. But as you start progressing and allowing your body to create more endorphins and the positive types of hormones instead of the destructive types of hormones that will rust out your body and start causing mental illness and physical issues like autoimmune disorders, then your life just gets better because when you feel better, everything is, you can see things clearer and you can see the opportunities that were always there. You know, I, I think as much crap as we can talk about. TikTok and how addictive it is and stuff. And I have to cut myself off sometimes. I wasn't on TikTok when I was in my funk, you know, and I feel if I had gone on TikTok, maybe it would have, I would have learned some of the things that I've since seen people talking about where they were able to shift out of the funk that they were in. And, and that's a big reason why I'm on TikTok and Instagram now talking about the things that I talk about is so I can help people. And you just never know who needs to hear what you have to say. And if there's somebody out there who's listening to me give my sermons and they think that nobody wants to hear what they have to say, because maybe they heard that from their sister growing up that nobody cares, Kate, or whatever. That's not true. That's not true. And 
the person who said that to you, they said it because of who they are, not who you, not because of who you are. So you can't define yourself on other people's assessments of you. Your identity isn't dependent on what others think, what others say about you, how they've reacted to you. Your identity is dependent on who you want to be and you get to choose that. And yeah, that's what yeah. I want to close with. And with regard to energy levels. Yeah. And I'm down almost seven pounds. I've not been in a deficit the last couple of days because I've been with family, but I don't think I've been overeating either. So that's a good thing. Great. Yeah. You're, well, you look good. Thanks. I still feel, you know, I see the chunk that I want to lose and I'm excited to see it. I'd, I'd like to get it down at least 20 pounds by February. That's kind of the goal. 20, 30 pounds would be ideal because I feel like I, I say that, but if I'm building muscle at the same time, then it might not look the same, you know, numbers wise. So I'm unattached. Yeah. I'm only attached to showing up and doing this and being committed. And I've also noticed that like with not being in a calorie deficit for the last day or it's been like two days that I for sure haven't been in it, maybe three days, but I've caught myself thinking like, oh, like I'm failing or I'm not doing this. But mm -hmm. I also was like, well, this is the time in the past where I've tried to be better at this that I would have given up and I'm not doing this because you have a bad day or a bad week doesn't mean you can't go right back to what was working so beautifully before and what you were enjoying. So yeah. I think I, I think you've noticed this too. Like I've actually really enjoyed being in a calorie deficit. Have you? Yeah. Like having fun with it. Gamifying it. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Like you're having fun with it. You're going, you're like on Reddit threads and like trying to really learn everything you can about it. And yeah. Yeah. So, and I'm not hungry. That's the best yeah. part. I thought I was going to be hungry, mm -hmm. but I just wasn't eating the, the enough calories and that's why I was hungry before because I some some reason I had in my head that I had to eat only 1200 calories or something. It's so messed up because that because if you go on like a my fitness pal or something and you put in your goal weight it's going to and that you want to lose it, it but with a certain amount of time it's going to tell you to eat nothing. So, yeah. Nope, we are being healthy about it and that's all that matters. Yeah, and I'm super motivated so. to get to the goal without any kind of drug intervention and then talk about it. Cause I think people just, yep. people were probably people who turn to those drugs and then they, they probably tell themselves some of the same things that I was telling myself that it's too hard, that it's going to suck, that they can't stick to it, that they have all this food noise, but there's so many underlying things, you know, the food noise might come because you don't have clarity about why you have the food noise it's not something you can't control all right well thanks for tuning in, everybody i hope you guys enjoyed the episode the podcast is on substack now primarily it's on all the other channels as well if you go to the kateawakening.com you can access my little substack website and leave comments on this episode so you can let us know what you thought yeah all right thanks everybody